All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. I'm going to try to stay really close to this thing, I guess. Um, my name is Sean D. Armand. I'm a web architect for UC Davis um, in the Information and Educational Technology Unit. That's what we call the uh, Central IT Unit uh, at UC Davis. We're going to talk about configuration management. Um, it, it's nice the way it sort of worked out today. We have three configuration management uh, sessions in a row. So I don't know if you've been to the, we went to the one that Michael Anello was just at, which was awesome. I made sure to see what he was talking about. Um, we'll cover just a little bit of that because I didn't know what his session was going to be, um, but not much. Um, we're going to move past that pretty quickly. Um, and then after this, I don't know where, where it is, but after this, there's another configuration management. And I'm super excited about that because that has to do with kind of the 2.0 configuration management that they're working on um, in, in Drupal 8, kind of the next evolution of. So I'm looking forward to that too. Um, we're going to talk about uh, single site configuration management versus multi-site configuration management, um, kind of the differences between install profiles and distributions, at least the way it is in my brain. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the differences in configuration, about default configuration versus features. Um, remember features from Drupal 7 who loved using that? A couple people loved using it. Nobody really loved using it, but you're going to love using it in Drupal 8 because it's, um, it, it does really what it was originally meant to do. So um, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about the kind of the workflows around this and the tools. Um, and uh, we should have a plenty of time for questions, too. Is this humming? Just slightly. All right. How about that? That's better. OK. Um, okay, so Drupal 8 configuration management, uh, again, if you're an expert at this, you already know this, or if you went to Mike's talk, you just learned about this, but we just need to all be on the same page so that we can move on from there. Configuration management, um, the configuration is stored in these files, right? These files are YAML files, they're in your file system, but they're also stored in the database. and so. The, they call it the active configuration, the configuration that your site is currently running at this exact moment is stored in the database, and you can export them into files, into, the, into YAML files, and you import them into your database. So it's a, and there, there's, there's um, the configuration are actually entities, the Drupal has this entity system, configuration is actually entities, and you can import and export them into these YAML files. This is kind of a simple, uh, a simple workflow for, for a single site where you would have your active uh, configuration stored in the database. You would do a, this is these are Drush commands. You can do it through the UI, you can do it through Drush, you can do it through Drupal console, but you would do a config export, dump your files, uh, dump your configuration into files. You would make edits to them somehow. You could use a text editor, you could use a local development environment. However, you end up making changes to them. And then you do a config import back into your site. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty simplistic way of doing it. You, you generally don't want to do a whole lot of, um, of configuration editing in your live site. Um, and I'm going to, in a few slides, tell you how I'm lying when I say that. But that's, uh, that's generally considered to be bad practice. Here's just another one. This would be like a deployment. So maybe you had a dev, uh, a dev server somewhere, or maybe your dev is your local, kind of the same thing. You would, you would work on it in the UI. You would export the configuration, and then you would import the configuration into prod. We good? Pretty simple. All right. In a single Drupal site, you have your files, like you have your, your code, which is represented by one with the little brackets, and YAML files, and all of those are stored in your Git repository. And your database, or you know, on your, on your live site, your database is not stored in the repository. So that's the little Git thing and the little dotted lines, that's what that means. You store all this stuff in your repository so that it can e easily be moved through your dev, test, live, local, whatever, workflow to get stuff into the database. And this works great. This works great for a single site. It's not bad for two. What happens when you have a lot, though? Like, really a lot. So at UC Davis, we, uh, we manage about 700 websites in one big multi-site. 
Can you imagine trying to run configuration over 700 sites and deploying it through that workflow? No. So, and the other thing is we give our, uh, we give our content editors access to edit the configuration. Um, we provide basically a SaaS product to UC Davis, to the, the departments of UC Davis, and they can spin up their website. And these are generally content editors. These are not developers. They don't know what a YAML is. And so they need to be able to do things like place blocks. Well, placing blocks is, that's configuration. They, they need to be able to name their site, and they don't want to have to deal with going through a developer to do that. So, um, oh, other things too, like their slogan, Google Analytics, uh, you know, ID, all kinds of stuff that they're going to be editing their content or editing the configuration, and they're actually going to be doing that, you know, on their site it, the, to, to try to train um, content editors a workflow to go through a, you know, dev site export configuration live, it's, it's, it's just not going to happen. So we basically just don't use them. Um, for individual sites, I should say, right? So all of the sites on our platform have their active configuration in the database, and the site managers go in and they just edit their configuration. Remember back, anybody remember back in old Drupal 5 days where you just did stuff in the database and if you screwed something up, well, bummer. So that's the risk, right? There's, a, there's kind of a risk reward thing here, right? And so, we, we had to think about this really hard when we were doing the development. So, you know, is this the right way of doing it or do we have to carefully manage all these different sites, right? Um, so, yeah, all of it, all of it is stored in, in the database. Um, so, this is how we do it. We have our code base and our code base is our distribution, right? This is our, the, 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 all of the Drupal code and all the extra stuff that goes in vendor, everything that gets pulled in, we deploy it all to, we, we use Site Factory for this, so we deploy it all to Acquia's Git repository, and then six to, actually, I need to update my slide, we're about 700 sites, we have about 300 live sites, but a Drupal site's a Drupal site, whether it's in development or whether it's uh, people are still editing the content or it's a clone site that they were trying something out on, it's still a Drupal site, it's still on the platform. So, we deploy the code to Site Factory. We don't deploy any of the configuration files unique to each site. So what that also means, um, when, we, uh, when we're developing Site Farm, we generally develop it, so, okay, I'm gonna use the word Site Farm, you see the little thing, this is what we call our service to the campus in, case, in case I keep saying things like that. So, um, when, we, when we're developing it, we, we really develop it for a fresh install, right? So you spit it up, and we have hundreds of BHAT tests that we run against it, and we all run against it for, a, for an initial install. Um, and there's all kinds of configuration, a whole, whole bunch of stuff that we have in there. We'll get on, I'll, I'll get to that, about what all that stuff is. But when we're developing it, it's, it's really for an initial install. We push the code base up there. Now, what we also do is sometimes we have some more bespoke sites, and we have site farm sites that we run that is not on Aqua. We actually run them on Pantheon as, as well. And so we have a separate distribution that's, that's slightly different because the modules are a little different than we need um, for Pantheon that we do for Site Factory. But in the case of our individual kind of more bespoke sites, each code base is totally separate. They tend to be a little bit more custom sites. I mean, if it's, if it's just the same sort of site as all the rest of them, might as well have it in Site Factory with all the rest of them. It's a lot easier to update them. So, but if we have an individual site, we'll, we will use the configuration, go through that normal single site, where it'll essentially be like a single site deployment with the configuration. Um, and the, the configuration, the code base is together in one package as we deploy that through, through Pantheon's workflow. All right. So I'm gonna talk about the difference between an install profile uh, and a distribution. And this is, this may not be you know, accurate, um, but it's the way my brain thinks about it. I think it's the right nomenclature and I think generally we agree on this. And I've been giving presentations on this for longer than a lot of people, so maybe I can just decide this now, I, I don't know. Um, so 
this is how I'm going to define a profile in a distribution. And so um, when I say a profile, when I say a distribution, this is what I mean. And I'll probably get it wrong once or twice and then have to correct myself. So the install profile is the thing that sits in your, in your web root in the profiles folder. In there, um, there's already a couple profiles. There are several now in Drupal 8. Um, in fact, there's a brand new one called Umami. But there's another, there's the, the standard install, there's the limited, um, and then there's some test profiles and stuff that are in there too. So Drupal core comes with a number of profiles. Um, and so when we built SiteFarm, we built a profile. This is a bundle of code and configuration and custom modules and all kinds of stuff and it's all sitting in this one folder um, called Site Farm. and when we put when we build the code base using Composer um, it goes in the profiles folder. Now a distribution is what we're calling kind of the, 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 the project root so the thing that has the Composer JSON file and you say Composer install and it has the Composer lock file um, that's what that's what the distribution is. So I need to continue here and see. Do, 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 do. Okay, so here are all the things that are in the install profile before I move on to the distribution. So um, like I said, it's in, the, it's in your profiles. And my profile, ours would be called Site Farm. Um, it would have an install file. Um, it would have a config folder because profiles are actually, Drupal kind of considers them like modules. It, it, Profiles, themes, and modules are all what Drupal calls extensions. So Drupal will sort of treat it like, like a module in some ways. There's differences. But that means it has a config file, a config folder. Um, you might have some custom modules. You might have some custom features. Um, uh, or, or some features. In, that's in the modules features folder. Uh, and you have some contrib modules. The distribution is the thing that's in the web root, like I was saying. You have your composer JSON file that's there, and that, you, that has, uh, requires the, the, the profile um, and, a, and usually some other things. You end up with a composer lock file, so after you do the, or, uh, after you do the update or, or um, the install, you end up with this composer lock file that defines exactly what your project has in it, exactly which versions of all the modules, Drupal core, all the Symfony stuff that it pulls in when you, when you run Composer. Um, there will be a web folder. Um, and then in there, there's extra stuff like web modules, contrib, web core. So we'll make this just a little interactive. Which There's a couple of these that don't belong in your Git repository. Who wants to tell me which ones? Which one? Give me one. Uh, well, I mean, from these. Look at the look up here. Oh, core. Core. Good. Yeah. <laughs> what? Contrib. Yeah, both of the contribs, really. Composer.lock. No, composer.lock definitely ends up in your uh, in your Git repository. That's the thing that will that without composer. It says exactly which thing. Because when you deploy and you do a composer install, it looks to composer lock and says. These are all the versions of all the modules. So um, this is a difference, actually, between like uh, Drush Make back in the day, because you might run Drush Make on, on your test server, and then you go and run Drush Make on your live server, but a new version of the module came out since then, because there was no lock file to actually lock. You would have to specifically enter the module version numbers. Well, that's what Composer Lock does. And so it's really important that when you do the install, that it has all exactly the modules and exactly the versions of everything that you ran all your test suite against. So yeah, the, um, these go in your Git repository, but you don't have to put core or any of the contrib um, modules uh, folders in there because when you run composer install, it's going to put all, all that stuff in there, all that, all that stuff in there for you. It significantly lowers the bloat in the, in the repository, that is true. And it makes it way less likely to have like merge conflicts and all that stuff. So you end up, like your distribution repository should be pretty lean. There's not much in there. You'll have some stuff in there, obviously Composer JSON Unlock. You'll probably also have in the, um, in the web folder, you'll probably have sites default in there if you have some settings, .php stuff or um, the, the D, your, your, your default local PH, uh, settings PHP, stuff like that. So you might have some of that stuff that's in there. Um, if you're using Site Factory like we are, you might have, they, they're called factory hooks. And so those are extra PHP files that, that get loaded into settings.php for every site. So there's a number of, um, there's a number of things that are there. Did I go back? Oh, crap, you're going to make me do this again.
All right. Do 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 do. Come on. Uh, you're gonna make it go through it. Okay. This is the problem with you. I know fancy animations, right? Okay. So here's, here's another way to think about this, um, and I'm going to use composer, uh, kind of co a composer require type of workflow for this. So your distribution has a composer JSON file in it, and in that there's cer certain dependencies that your distribution has. And so your profile um, is, one of those, is one of those dependencies. So when you're building your, your distribution, you might say, composer require UC Davis site farm. And that would, be the, uh, that would be the profile that gets brought in. But your profile itself has a Composer JSON file too. You wouldn't ever run Composer install on, on the profile because you're going to end up with a big mess on your hands. You always run it from the distribution. But the profile will have a Composer JSON file because it itself has dependencies. So this is where... Um, this is where your profile would have all, all of the Drupal modules and uh, that you would need the theme. So if you had a, a, a theme, um, your, all the Drupal modules go in there. Any other things that you want to build as part of your, of your distro, um, then it would, it would probably go in the profile. However, you can also put Drupal modules and stuff in the, in the distribution composer JSON as well. And there's good reasons for that. So, yeah? Are you saying the profile can have modules inside of it? The, the profile would, in the composer JSON file, you would list all the modules that you, yeah. want, to, that you want to include. Yeah. So when you run composer install, it kind of does this chain. Okay, I, I have dependency. The distribution has dependency. I depend on the profile. The profile says, okay, but I have dependencies too. I have dependencies on the web form module and the path auto module and, and you know, all, BHAT and, and all this stuff, right? So, um, and maybe, maybe the site farm theme is, a, is another dependency. Um, but then your distribution can have modules listed in, in the composer JSON file there too. And so the reason for that is that we have, like I said, a couple different distributions. Um, where we have a distribution that we're deploying to Acquia, and it includes like the ACSF module, which stands for Acquia Cloud Site Factory, but that's a required module that needs to be in there in order for it, the whole magic to work. Um, and then we also have one for Pantheon, because there's a couple modules that if you're gonna deploy to Pantheon, you probably wanna have these. And it's really convenient to have these in the, um, in the distribution and not have to have them in the profile because the profile doesn't care where it goes. It, we want to build this profile that'll work in, um, to, to, deploy, to deploy anywhere. We don't, we don't need to make it um, hosting uh, specific. It can be hosting agnostic. And so there's no reason, even if you were to turn it off, it's like, why have these extra like, ACSF module in there if a bunch of sites aren't really going to need it? So it's better to keep only what's really a dependency, something you, you know, it's required, that's the word. So better to have that stuff in the profile and then put the, uh, the hosting specific stuff in the distribution. Are we good? Does this make sense? Any questions on this before I continue? Good. All right, so when you're building a profile, you're going to put YAML files somewhere because the purpose of a profile is when you run the install, it does a lot of default configuration for you. It kind of sets up a preloaded site, right? We don't, want, we don't want to just give people Drupal core with no modules turned on every time they want a Drupal site. We actually set it up in a certain way um, so that we can have this configuration loaded when the site is installed. So here's, here's where you're going to find a lot of the, or all of the YAML files. They're going to be in the My Profile or, or Site Farm config folder. But then if you've built custom modules, um, they'll be in the My Profile Modules custom My Module config. And then if you build custom features, which is basically a pretty module, um, it's kind of the same thing. And note, there's also this config install and config optional. And, um, I'd really like to have a beer with the person who figured this or that, that configured this and have them tell me what 
the hell this is really all about um, because I don't really understand why there's these two things. But my rule of thumb is try to get as much as you can in install. And then if it blows up, you might have to move something to optional because there, it, there's, this, there's this sort of dependency hell that you get in with configuration where if, if you, know, you try to install a configuration but the module's not yet installed, then it, it's not even pretty. It just sort of all explodes and your site just doesn't install. So generally stuff can go in install, but some things do need to go in optional. The things I've found that tend to go in optional are like uh, a block placement sometimes, um, sometimes views that depend on, let's say, a content type or something that, that hasn't been installed yet. So basically, you just try to put it in install. If it explodes, it'll tell you which one's failed and just start moving those to optional. If you have a better idea on how to do it, I'll buy you a beer too. So, um, in the my profile config, what kind of stuff should go in there? Because I told you there's three places where you could put your config. Remember, when you do like a, a, a config export, you, you dump like the whole thing, right? You just, you got hundreds of files in there. So, the, the purpose of this is when you're, when you're building, a building a profile, you want to store some of this um, configuration in a place so that when your site is installed for the first time, this configuration is loaded. And these are the things that we store in our, uh, our site farm config install or, or optional. Um, and these are things that we sort of expect that site managers will end up changing. Um, and if you see, there's some of these things, like, like I talked about. So there's whatever star.settings.php, that's most of your basic site configuration or basic system configuration, they, they, they call it. And so that'll be stuff like the site name and Google Analytics and really basic, um, basic configuration. The block.block .block stuff, that's like block placement. Um, so this is stuff that we want to have this stuff installed by default, but then we expect the site managers to go in and start changing this stuff up. So we call this default configuration. This is stuff that's installed once, and it's not going to be touched afterwards. Um, user roles, we, we had to think really hard about this one. We went back and forth on this one. Should we have the user role um, is default configuration or, or as, a, as a feature that we would revert? And we, we opted to go for default configuration. I'm glad we did, because there are a lot of sites where people have decided that they want slightly different uh, permissions. And the way the user role um, works is that all of the permissions for that role are all baked into that, into that one file. So we, uh, we, we made it as default configuration. Um, all, all the date formats, uh, the contact form stuff, that's just the default one that comes with core. So we probably didn't have to put it in there, but if we've made some changes to it and you know, we wanted to add another field or something, we could make that. Um, the theme, because we want, you know, they, uh, when they install the site, we want them to have the, the site farm theme in there, but they can create their own sub-themes, create their own custom themes, and they might go and change that. Um, and user mail, obviously, because not everybody's going to have the same email address on their website. And then a number of views. Um, the front page view, specifically, which is really no more than a blank page that goes to the front page because we want they wanted to have something that drops blocks on there. So we have that one on there too. Again, we expect them to, to change this over time. Um, similarly with custom modules, if we build a custom module um, for our distro, um, and there's sort of two schools of thought on this, depends on how, how complex you want to make it. You could make a custom module and you could keep it in a totally separate repository and you could require it with you know, a composer uh, composer require, but if that module is only ever going to be used for your profile and you don't need the extra complexity. And so most of our custom modules are, are here. They're installed right in the, um, in the profile folder. And so that'll be like my module settings and, and maybe a view or anything else that's, that's whatever configuration that your custom module needs um, goes in that folder there. And, and site managers might change this too. That's why we're calling it default configuration. Um, site managers might change this stuff. So now we get back to features. So in Drupal 7, features was the way that you deployed configuration because you had no other option. Um, but now with config management, you know, if you really wanted to go through that single site config deployment, um, you don't need features anymore. You just do it with the site, the, the core, and it, it works great. Um, 
but features comes into play when you have a bunch of stuff that we, or configuration that we expect to revert. We say like, okay, we own this stuff. You're not allowed to touch it. And because we might revert it. And so features gives you a really nice interface for exporting this stuff for one, um, bundling configuration together into, into features that are, have something to do with each other. Um, and, uh, and, and stuff that, like I said, we might, we might actually revert. So these are the kind of things that we tend to put in features. Um, node types, block types, fields, um, path auto patterns for that node type. Anything, you know, a feature, we have a feature called uh, site farm article. And so that contains everything that has to do with our article content type. It includes some taxonomy, uh, yeah, a couple taxonomy vocabularies and um, the path auto pattern for the article and some views for the, the news feed and the blog feed and um, all that stuff we put together into a feature. And separate features, like we have one for article, one for each content type, basically. We have one for each block type. Um, and there's others, too. So are you saying that this is basically what you guys are managing as part of your SaaS product? And so every time you roll this out, if they somehow not manipulate this, either they get changed back to the people? Yes. And also, even, even further than that, we might change it on purpose. Right? So if, um, if we find a bug or we find a better way to do the, our main news feed that we want everybody to use, we might say, okay, we're gonna change the way this works. Oh, here's a great example. We had a bug in our RSS feed. It wasn't rendering properly. It wasn't being read properly by RSS. We're like, crap, we need to do that. In fact, it was even crashing sites. Um, no, 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 it was, anyway. It was causing problems in more ways than just the fact that the XML, the, the RSS feed wasn't being um, rendered properly. So. We said, okay, well, we need to fit, and that's just a view, right? So we need to fix that. So we fixed it, and we were very, very confident when we said, okay, you know, config update, revert, uh, view, view, whatever it was, that, um, that we're not overriding somebody else's work, um, that they didn't make some major change that was critical to their, uh, to their site, and we can update it across the entire platform all at once with a simple update hook. That's true. For the recording, um, what Mariana was saying is that you could even selectively do it so that the update hook only fires on, say, a couple different websites. Or you could not even roll an update hook and manually go in and use Drush or something to update individual sites just to see that it works. So that's true as well. OK. Does that sort of make sense? And, and this is. this isn't written in law. This is just the way we did it. it, it but I'll tell you, it works out pretty well. Um, so you can decide, just like we made a decision early on about the, the user roles, if you're making one of these for your you know, campus or for your agency or whatever, or you're trying to make a SaaS product, then you can decide what you want to have um, revertible that you say, look guys, I'm going to revert this if you, if you screw around with it. And like no types are a great example of that because you don't want them to go and like start adding extra fields and then you're going to revert it and um, that could be very, very messy. Um, and what stuff you say, no, go nuts, go nuts, you know, just go and edit anything you want, right? Okay, so here I'm going to walk through this workflow. Um, this is a workflow that we do when we actually want to make a change um, and we want to deploy that change of configuration across the entire platform. So we, let's say we create a new field. So we go to our site farm articles, um, you know, we go to admin structure, we go to the manage fields, um, we add a new field. And uh, we, uh, the, the configure node form and, and, the, and the displays, right? So the, 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 the edit form and the, the displays, we do all that stuff. So then we go to the features and we export that, um, we export that feature again, and it should pick up that there's new new configuration there. The nice thing about using features for this is that you don't have to like export like your whole site configuration with hundreds and hundreds of files and try to figure out which ones are the right ones. Features just knows, and features is pretty smart because it actually knows the dependencies because it can read the configuration files. It knows what the dependencies are. So you say. I want this node type, it's like, all right, but I'm gonna need these things too, and it just starts picking them for you. And then you can selectively, uh, or deselect them if you want, or add more, you can, there's a really nice interface for, for doing this right within the UI. And then you download it. 
Um, and what you're going to find is there's going to be new and, and updated YAML files, right? So these are the ones that are going to be changed. Um, obviously, the node type itself, um, and uh, actually not the node type itself, but the field uh, storage, as well as the um, the field uh, uh, the field displays. Um, and then what we'll do um, is write that update hook. So we go to the site form article dot install file, and we write this update hook um, to uh, to revert that feature for for the entire platform. So this, can you see that? Actually, that's not bad. Okay, cool. Um, so this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what our uh, standard update hook, where we say, okay. We have to call in the config, up config update's a module, by the way, so you, we will need that too. But config update has this revert where you can selectively revert individual um, or import individual, uh, uh, individual config here. So then you saw those ones that I had on that last page. Um, and, uh, oh, God, okay. Those. So you see all those YAML files that are there. So those are all the configuration that we need to revert. And so, you'll see a line for each one of those. Notice there's an import and a revert. You do have to get that right. If you tell it to revert something that doesn't exist, it'll blow up. If you tell it to import something that does exist, it'll also blow up. Sorry about that. <laughs> but you do have to make sure you get the right one. And so, um, anyway. Are you still using reverts as a nomenclature? I did not write this module. The question was, why are they still using revert as a nomenclature? Well, you know, what's funny is that features revert was, was, was a thing, right? You had to revert your features. But this is config update. So config update is uh, different. And so they, they still decide to use the word revert. I, I can talk about it later. Okay. Um, so this is a, just a, a simple update hook here. Um, we'll also, we would also do an update hook if, it, if um, here's, a, here's another example. I don't have a slide for this, but let me talk about this too because I use the, uh, the user roles as, a, as an example of default configuration, but sometimes what we need to do is we added a new module and we wanted to make sure that, the, that all the roles had the appropriate permissions for that, um, uh, for that new module, whatever the, whatever the permissions are. And so there's an API for that too. I mean, there's just functions for adding a permission to a role. So we don't do a full revert of that YAML file, of that, of that configuration. Um, but we do say, hey, add this permission to this role. Add this permission to this role. And so we can do that within an update hook too. In fact, and this is kind of cool, you can add permissions to roles and it, even if that module that provides that permission isn't even installed. So this is how you can, so we have modules that we have as part of our code base that are not installed by default, yet we still uh, put all of the permissions for those modules in the YAML file by default, as well as if we install them halfway through, we use those, those, um, those functions to add the permission to those roles. And the benefit of that is once they turn on the module, hey, they already have all the permissions that they need. Because one of the things we, we don't allow, we, we do it, when they ask us, um, but we don't allow our users to go to the permissions page and edit the whole permissions for the site because then they could do all kinds of crap. Um, and in fact, another thing that we did actually just recently is we created a kind of a, uh, a mini permissions page that just gives them access to a few of the permissions that we think they probably want to change. Things like content moderation, um, moving you know the, the 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 transitions and stuff like that. So. Um, Yeah, so we, what Mariana said, I'll, I'll sort of repeat what we have is we have a certain number of roles, we have the permissions, and generally that's just that. Um, however, if they say, you know, we're doing something special, can you, make, can, you, can you make this permissions change for us? We're like, yeah, sure. So we'll go and do it. Um, but then we found we, we were doing it a lot, and so that's why we created a special mini permissions page that just lists a few of the permissions that we find that people want to change all the time and really has zero consequences. So just let them do it themselves. Um, we also don't let them create roles, but sometimes they want a new role and so they can ask us and we'll add a role for them, you know? Um, but we generally don't want them, because once they have a role, it doesn't, 
they can't do anything with it, you know, because they can't edit the permission. So we, um, we, we don't have them do roles. And I think actually the permissions to add roles is the same permissions, permission to do permissions. So there, you can't even separate those out. Um, here's some tools. Uh, Obviously, the configuration manager that's part of core and features module we talked about, that config update uh, module is what we have to use for, um, for all the, the update hooks. This is an interesting one. Um, this lock features, um, we built this for the express per, uh, purpose of allowing our uh, site builders, so that, that's a role that we have, site builders to say create new views and content types, taxonomy, vocabularies, and block types, but not edit the existing ones. So this is how we are able to keep our features pure um, so that we can revert them without there being problems and uh, they can't go in and edit it. And so um, I don't have a, a picture of it, but what it does is it changes the little edit button on the screen to just a little lock icon. So. They can see that it's there, they just can't actually edit anything. But then I learned today in Mike Lanello's past session that the config read-only module actually does pretty much the same thing. I thought, uh, and I think this is new, where there's actually a whitelist functionality where you can say, all right, you're allowed to change these things. And so I would kind of want a blacklist functionality. So I don't know if it, I don't know, I'm not sure if it does that. Um, so we, but we have this lock features, and this is, um, this is on our site farm seed distro, you can find that. Um, on GitHub, if you want to go look at that, it's a it's a it's a pretty simple module, but it really really works and it's extensible, so you can write you can you can extend it. Um, uh, plugin, you use a plugin mark to to okay um, to add your own. Um, uh, it, it works on um, on routes, so you can just decide which routes are your, people are allowed to go to and which routes people are just not. The config read only module does it slightly differently where you can actually go to those pages, you just can't hit submit on the button. So, eh, one or the other. Um, also like the config ignore module, so that's sort of the, the, config ignore is sort of the opposite as well, so it's like, um, when I, I gave the example of a site from site on Pantheon, well, if we have site managers that, or you know, editors that still want to move blocks around, um, even in a situation where we are using the real, you know, sites configuration management and deploying configuration, say on Pantheon, the config ignore module will let us say, okay, but these sorts of configurations like blocks, um, like uh, web forms, like uh, maybe the, the site name, maybe uh, list these things, just don't worry about those at all when you're doing config export or config import, just ignore those entirely. And so that's a nice way where we can still, you know, lock a lot of stuff down and yet still allow people to do some config um, just live on the, on the live site. So you need config, text, and config export, export from the Yeah. Yep. So yeah, config export, just those files just won't come out. And if those files happen to be in your config uh, directory and you do a config import, it won't even look at them. So it's, it's a very accurately named module. It just ignores the configuration just ignores it completely. Um, and then entity clones, so this is great. Remember I said that people can't create, um, people can't uh, edit the existing content types, but they can create their own. Well, they can also clone their own because remember the old node clone module where you could go to a node and push go and, or push clone and it would create a, a new node based on that other node. Well, the entity clone module lets you do that too because nodes are entities, but guess what? Configuration are entities too. So you, they can go to the, uh, uh, content types page, and n now it says locked, but there is the little arrow there. They can click the little arrow and say clone, and now they can have their own full version of the article content type with all the fields all ready to go, and then they edit themselves, and then if we ever do a, you know, a config update, they're like, they basically fork to that point. So they're not getting any of our updates, but that also means that any um, architectural, like data architecture changes that they make to their content type were not we're not screwing with that, you know, it's sort of on their own. And they know like, okay, they're not gonna get any of the new cool stuff that we do, but they're not gonna screw anything else, else up either and they can go off and do whatever they need to do. So that's useful too. Yeah, Eric? Uh, does that work well for like the layouts and stuff when the layout is kind of like attached to the original? I don't know. Uh, okay, the, the question was, does that work with layouts as well? And the answer, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, we, we're not using the layouts yet. 
um, because there was complications with how we had already built our theme and stuff. We're working on it, but we haven't really gone into the new layout builder. Um, we also don't use panels, so I don't know how it works with that either. Anybody know the answer? Okay, I'm going to try to repeat that uh, for the recording. So the layouts that are based on the content type are configuration, and so they probably should be cloned, but I've never tested it. I don't know if you've tested entity clone when you... Like a default configuration that you can export for that, but that. Right. So it is, it is configuration, so it's possible that it'd be part of the, the entity clone. Um, but the, the layouts that, are, that you do it on an individual node, if you've turned that on for your site, that's always stored in the database. And, and since it's attached to, a, let, let's say, an instantiation of that entity, it, probably, it wouldn't be part of the clone of the content type, but it might be part of the clone of that, of that entity. It's a, field, so it's a field, you're right. So it's a field. So it, it, would, it would be. And that's all I have. So is there any other questions? We have, uh, we have a few minutes here uh, for questions. None? Yeah. What the worst thing that's happened The worst thing that's happened. I need some help here, guys. Um, as far as configuration goes, oh. I know you have What is the biggest hurdle you have to overcome in life managing this The biggest hurdle we've ever had to overcome managing this big configuration conglomerate. Probably trying to get the developers to figure out where they shove things. <laughs> That's why I made this presentation. <laughs> so Mark says they're probably trying to get the developers to figure out where they're supposed to be storing the configuration in the right place. And also, like, where do the update, where, where do the update hooks go? It's sort of like, it could go anywhere. Like, it'll work. You could throw the config files anywhere. But we're trying to organize this in some sort of sensible way. And so we started working with other campuses, San Francisco and, and LA, and I kept getting the same question, like, well, where do I put this stuff? I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make a presentation, and we'll record it, and now everybody will be able to see. <laughs> yeah, Eric. Um, this is a, uh, the question is, when is subprofiles going to be in core? And that's a little out of the scope of this presentation. <laughs> However, I will say that the subprofile patch, which I would very much like to go in core, does work pretty well with this model. And you can actually, in your subprofile, override configuration from your base profile just by having the same file name in your subprofile. So it kind of does an install of the base profile, and then it does an install of the subprofile just overriding whatever you had in the base profile. So it actually works really well, um, and that was one of the things we were kind of astounded by when we were, when we were playing around with that profile inheritance patch. Um, it is fixed now, though. It was broken for a while, but it's, it, the patch is actually working. We just need to get it in core. Yeah. Have you ever had a problem where you put a config somewhere and then you realize it's maybe site editors had to edit that later and run into any issues? Yeah. Um, yes. Actually, that um, this is probably a good answer to uh, Mariana's question too about the, the, the one of the hardest things we ever had to figure out. And this is this is what happened. So remember, I was saying there was that RSS feed um, uh, that got screwed up, right? Well, we didn't put it in the feature. We put it as default config. And so they, because it was actually the taxonomy term RSS feed, and it was just the core taxonomy term view. And so we didn't put it in a feature. We put it in default config, and people could have changed it. And we sort of made the executive decision, this is broken. We're going to revert it anyway. How many people do we think have actually gone and changed this thing? Probably zero. So, and if they did, they probably screwed it up. So we're just going to make the executive decision to just do it. And we did, and exactly zero people have complained so far. So I think it was all right. But yeah, that can definitely happen if, if we put something in default config and we're like, 
crap, now we really do need to revert that for everybody. What do we do, right? And so one of the things we thought of was, like Mariana said, we can um, selectively revert. So we can put it back into the default config so that all new sites have the good thing. And then if anybody, want, if anybody is having this problem, we can go and you know, just fix it individually on each, on each site for the ones that really want to. But we knew this was broken for everybody or probably pretty much everybody. So we made the executive decision, like we're, we're just gonna revert this for everybody. Um, but yeah, that can, that can be a problem. If someone had customized their taxonomy term view to be, you know, add some filters so that some terms don't show up in this one, or you know, if they had done something special like that, we would have reverted it and then they would have been back to square one and they wouldn't have even known. I mean, we, we publish it in our release notes, but it's a, that's sort of an obscure thing. <laughs> So yeah, that's that has happened. Okay, so follow up: Have you tried? Have you looked at experimenting with allowing there to be some configuration merging, where you do share the control, where if someone overrides it, you stop overriding it. Um, the other thing, okay, that's actually a lot easier because the way we do our update hooks is we selectively decide what we're going to override or w which ones we're going to revert and which ones we're not. So if we make a change to the, the, the feature that says, you know, all new sites will have this, have this thing, um, we don't have to write that update hook if we don't want to. Um, the problem is, is if we forget and then down the line make another change and decide everybody needs that change, well, we, when you revert that, you, you revert it, right? So. Um, that could be problematic, I suppose, if we if we don't remember that we at one point made it so that we, you know, weren't going to revert it. But if we put it in a feature, generally we just want to revert it. Um, I'm thinking things like you know you can change the title of the view. Yeah. Do you have any way of, of you know, reverting the whole rest of the view, but you can use the title to make the view whatever they want because it doesn't affect them. So with our uh, lock, with our config um, site farm config lock. Uh, or feature, what do we call it, Sitefarm features lock, they can't edit it. So we don't, we don't have the problem with people editing stuff they're not supposed to edit. Um, we have the problem with us not configuring the module properly and them editing things that we didn't want them to edit but they were able to anyway and that was the, thing, that was the problem we got into. But um, anyway, yeah. No, it's on the it's on the root level. It's on the root level. The, so we prefix all of our roots with SF underscore. So anything that we any route that we make um, that's SF underscore just gets locked. Okay. But so that, that's a one configuration screen. It's like people need to edit or they can't. Yeah. Say, you can edit these two fields. Okay, so we've done that too, actually. So we we but in that case we can. Um, we, we created another uh, uh, form that extends the form um, in, uh, in, uh, for the object and then just remove the things that we don't want them to touch. So it's a whole other form that they're, that they're editing. Yeah, yeah. I think we're out of time. Thank you very much. I'm going to push the button.